All right, let me pick up where we left off in class. So I'm going to try to be somewhat thorough without taking forever, which is a tough thing. Uh, and of course, it's hard to know where to linger without someone to say, that's the thing I'm having difficulty with. So, you know, pause, look stuff up, uh, ask me questions. Um, but let's pick up where we were. I had this Sim 1 I had generated by mapping across uh, 10,000 fives the function one round. Let me show you a shorter version of that. Let's say I map from one to six one round. Just default map. I get this funny looking output. And this is a list. So let's pipe that into. I think it's is, is the function. It's a list vector. When you see list, well, essentially what's going on is a list is a very general data structure. It's a way to hold on to a bunch of different things. So it can be really useful. Uh, so for example, let's make just a really quick thing uh, where we do, do um, y1 on x1 from Anscombe. Anscombe is a built-in data set. Uh, you should look up the Wikipedia page for Anscombe's Quartet, highly worthwhile. Uh, but you can see out is a list of 12 items. So if I just say out, I get some default thing because it's a linear model object. But let's look at names of out. That's going to tell me the 12 different things in this object. Or I could look at the structure of out and it'll break it down. The model is a data frame of 11 observations of two variables, x1 and y1. It's giving the specific values. Uh, we've got the terms, we've got residuals, um, coefficients. We've got all these different things, but these are different sorts of things. Things like names that we want to bundle together with data, that we want to bundle together with coefficients, that we want to bundle together with uh, all kinds of other things. That's where a list is really useful. But for our case, what we really want is a vector. So let's go back to here so I can map this. And that'll be really good. Well, in this case, what it's doing is it's saying, we're going to plug one into one round. Then we're going to plug two into one round. And then we're going to plug three into one round. And that's perfectly fine, but check out what happens when I do one to 16. Those last few rounds I always lose because I'm guessing seven on a six-sided die, which is impossible. So I don't want to just map in a big, long vector because what's in there is doing a thing. Right? So I'm just repeating five a bunch of times. I'm just guessing five. So when I plug that into one round, I get one round where I'm betting on five, and sometimes it works more often. You lose. There we go. Finally. Now, let's see what happens if we plug ten one rounds. So in here, we got a warning. The condition has length greater than one, only the first element will be used. So in this case, it gave us one outcome. It took that first five and it ignored the rest and it threw a warning. So it just threw away all these and it only made one play. What map is doing is piping each of these fives into this call to one round. So in this case, it's doing it 10,000 times, and that's effectively the same as a for loop, as far as you and I are concerned, but map does it faster. So if we were to do a for loop with 10,000 rounds, or let's say a billion rounds, it would take kind of a while. With map, it's going to take at least less long than it would in a for loop. Uh, here, it's a little tough to read, especially if you're not totally comfortable with the map function uh, or the apply function that I mentioned at the end of class. 
Uh, so don't sweat it if you just default to using the for loop. But I'm going to walk you through the code that I've got here right now. So in class, we ran a simulation where we tried uh, 10,000 guesses of five, one round at a time. And then we rolled that together into a table where we adjusted so that we started with $10,000 more uh, or $1,000 as our starting point. Uh, by adding $1,000 to the whole thing, let me just show you what that looks like again. So we've got something like this. We got a whole column of rounds going down 10,000 rows. And we had a column of wealth. We lost the first round, so our wealth after round one is 9.99. Uh, we've added a thousand to everything. So before we add that thousand, the version that looks like this, we're starting from zero. So by adding a thousand to everything here, we get a thousand minus one, a thousand minus two. This is giving us our cumulative well, losses, but you add a thousand to all of them, you're essentially moving the starting point from zero to that thousand. Uh, so that's all that's going on with this little bit here. Um, and that means we don't have to do this funny stuff we did up here where we said the first round is going to be a thousand, but it's not even a real round. Here we just add a thousand to all of them, and since this is giving us the net effect, uh, it's just now the net effect relative to a starting point of a thousand. All right, so let's dig a little deeper. So simulating one gambler. Basically want to take the work I did up here and make it so that I can repeat it, not just for one gambler, but by repeating one gambler many times. So the situation I have is I'm going to think about a maximum number of rounds and some initial wealth. Uh, the winnings, I am... What have I got going on here? I think that maybe this could have been... Oh, this is just the same thing as that Sim 1. right? Sim 1, not a super descriptive name. Winnings is more descriptive. So here, let's just say... Max rounds equals a thousand initial wealth equals a hundred uh, so these are variables that should only exist in the function i'm making them exist on my general global environment workspace so that uh, i can use the code inside the function without having to rewrite it explicitly so when i run winnings having set those two values. Now we can look at winnings, and you can see I lost the first six rounds. Let's look at the first 25 rounds. Lost a bunch. Didn't start winning until way down there. Not very lucky. So that is the net effect, right? And again, we're just playing one round and we're doing the default bet of a dollar winning five dollars back minus your bet uh, otherwise okay now we do the same thing where we create that table spelled tibble for the tidyverse it's a tidy table uh round one to max round same as we did before wealth is the cumulative sum of the winnings plus that initial wealth which means when we run this out is giving us again a starting point of a hundred now for a thousand repetitions. If you look at the tail of wealth, what we'll see is oh whoops, let's look at the tail of out. The tail of out, we've lost money. We've lost money we don't have. Now, good rule to follow with gambling is don't get into debt. So we're gonna say if this gambler ever goes below zero we're going to stop them. we are not going to allow them to get this so we're going to pretend like this didn't happen 
we generated those winnings, now we're just going to cut off wherever they lost their initial wealth. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to ask um, where is this out dollar wealth, where is this column less than or equal to zero? Um, minimum of out wealth Let's do this. I'm pretty sure the way I've got it here works, but it's not quite fitting into my head right. So let's just find rows where out dollar wealth is less than or equal to zero. So mostly we're fine. And then here is where we start losing money. We could have blipped back up, but in this case, we could just delete all of the rows where that is the case, right? So we could just filter them out. Uh, but what I really want to know is, so this is going to tell me, this is going to give me this Boolean vector that I can use to find the rows where we ran out of money, where we had zero or less dollars. Uh, let's call it neg just for now. Those are negative rows. I'll call it neg rows. What I really want is to find the first of those negative rows. So, oh, I get what I was doing here. Um, so, actually, I kind of like what I had before a little bit better. So finding the negative rows, the next challenge is going to be finding where is the first of those negative rows and then cutting it off at that point. Now what I had here is a little different. So out wealth less than or equal to zero. In this case, there are places where that's the case. This is asking, is it ever the case that our worst case scenario is worse than zero? So in this case, we're going to get a true, right? But if we were to say, um, what is the min of out dollar wealth? Minimum value in that column is negative 130. So we could ask, is it ever the case that we go below 250? Well, we never go below 250. So if our rule was we can go $250 into debt, but no lower, then we would want to look at all of the thousand rounds we did here because we didn't go beneath that line. So here I'm defining bust as you go below zero, which is a better rule. So here it's going to be true. We did go bust in this round. So now I'm saying if that happened, then I want to find what was the round where we did go bust, and then I want to change out. And out, remember, is each round and the winnings. That's what we're going to get from our simulation. So our simulation is going to give us back this table with rounds and how much money we've got after each round. But it's not going to be the full thousand rounds if we ever run out of money. It's just going to go down to the point where we did run out of money. And we'll just see whatever the biggest value of the rounds is. That's how many rounds we lasted. So we check to see, did we go bust? If we went bust, we create this variable called bust round, and I'll explain that in a second, but let me show you how I use it. So when I say out, I get this whole data frame. If I say out in square brackets, and let's say one comma one, I get the first round in the first column. Here's first, sorry, not round. Well, first round, first row, second column for one comma two. If I do blank comma two, I get the whole second column. If I do one comma blank, I get the whole first row. So what I want is to say, I want from one to some number, right? So one to 10, here's my first 10 rows. I want to find where is that first row where we went bust? So it's going to turn out to be row 605. 
So what I do here is I say, give me down to row 605, and you can see now I've got just down to there. We hit zero, we have no more observations. So I take this and I call that out. So I'm relabeling out from a thousand things to 605 observations. So in the function, here's what we're doing. We're saying some number of rounds we're going to go, 1,000 by default, some initial level of wealth, 100 by default. We're going to run 1,000 rounds of one round where we're guessing just one, right? Keep it simple. You're just guessing one every single time. This is a simple game. Let's not make it complicated, more complicated than we need to. Uh, it would be, I guess, really the simple way to do this is just to say, what's the expected value? You get a one in six chance of winning five. You get a five in six chance of getting zero. You can figure it out that you're going to lose money on net. But we might ask a question of, yeah, that's the average outcome, but how lucky might you get? Or how unlucky might you get? This is a nice thing with simulations. So setting it up to allow the simulations, we can keep running those simulations and collect the data and ask how lucky was our luckiest simulation? Um, and that'll give us a better idea, not just of the average outcome, but what might happen besides the average, which is, of course, an important thing to know uh, if you're trying to manage some amount of risk. So maybe you have a bet where, well, let's say Russian roulette. Russian roulette, you have a one in six chance of dying. And maybe if you don't die, you get a million dollars. Well, that's a pretty good expected value, except for the whole dying thing. Your average outcome might look pretty nice, but that tail event ruins you. So understanding how unlucky you might be is as important as knowing how lucky you're going to be on average, right? On average, Russian roulette is you get one sixth of a million or five sixths of a million dollars and you're one sixth dead. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? We want to see what are the possible outcomes, not just the average outcome. So we run it, right? We do the game, we play it a thousand times. We wrap that together into a table so that we can see for each thousand rounds, where are we adding in our initial wealth, which we don't really need to run each round. We can just add it in after the fact. Then we find out, did we ever run out of money? We did. If we ran out of money, then we reset all of this. Did I get the exact same outcome? Something feels a little funny that I still have 605 observations. But I'm pretty sure I did rerun one round, and that should have given me a slightly different answer. Let's try... There we go. That's better. 275 rounds this time. So, the function itself. We set the winnings. We roll that together into a table and adjust for your initial wealth. We find out, given that level of wealth, if you ever went bust, we find out where you went bust, and we keep only the data from up until you went bust, and then we spit that back out. So, to simulate one gambler, we run like that. There, with our default, I've got 725 observations, two columns. So for each round, down to row 725. You can see the last six rounds, I had five, and I lost my way down to zero. And if I want to plot that, I can just pipe that output. This is why it's nice to have this in this table form with the round and the wealth. I can plot that through ggplot. We can see I start at 100, kind of bounce around. I'm lucky for a little bit, then I lose a bunch. Get a little lucky, then I lose a bunch. Get a little bit of money back, but I'm still losing, and in the end, I get down to zero and then stop. So, that allows us, that bit of functionality allows us to think about 
one gambler repeating this until they run out of money. So now we can think about stuff like what happens after some number of rounds, or what happens, uh, or how long do people last. Um, so let's simulate many gamblers. And here I'm going to take advantage of having built simulate one gambler. Now I'm going to use map again, and here I'm going to use it a little bit differently. Um, and this is one of these things, map can get kind of deep kind of quick, so don't sweat it if this is too much. Um, I expect to be getting a lot of submissions with a lot of for loops. Map is super nice when you kind of get your head around it, but it's pretty abstract. Uh, I still have some trouble writing map statements. Practice helps. Um, I can say that for sure. So now, our simulations. This is kind of like our winnings, except instead of winnings for one gambler, this is going to be winnings for however many gamblers we're dealing with. So let's say we're doing 10,000. They're going to repeat some number of rounds 10,000 times. We're going to pipe that 1,000 into simulate one gambler 10,000 times. Simulate one gambler takes the max rounds and the initial wealth. In this case, we're just letting the initial wealth, actually this should be here. Let's see if this works. Ah, I broke something. Okay. So let's just drop this for the time being. So when I do it like this, I'm ignoring, I'm no longer allowing us to change the default in simulate many gamblers. That'll do for now. Um, we would like to make this a little bit more general, but let's just say we're always going to have a hundred dollars as our starting point. We could change that here, reload this function and then reload this. That's a pretty sloppy, hacky way to do it, but whatever. <laughs> let's just get something working and then we can think about improving it. So we run our simulations and then we take our out, uh, that we're going to return, we create this out object. It's going to be a table from one to 10,000 observations, or in this case, one to a thousand observations, which we have saved as, well, you can see little x has a half a million observations. We'll get to there in a second. So we take our one to how many observations, and then we put into simulation the simulations. Now, here we have a list. So let's define our terms. How many equals, we'll make it a thousand. Max rounds, that's already a thousand. So when we run simulations, we'll look at the head. Actually, I guess we'll look at simulations item one once this finishes running. Um, simulations is going to give back a list. So these double brackets tells us to look at the first list item, which is going to be one call to simulate one gambler. So this is one gambler who won their first bet and went on for 235 rows before they lost their last dollar. So that is item one in simulations in this list of a thousand. We got all these different tables as each item. And then when we do this, it's going to show it down here. We've got 10,000 rows or what a thousand rows. Here's each simulation. And within each simulation, we've got the outcome from the call to simulate one gamble. Right, so you saw the first element there. So let's go ahead and do it like this. Now we can say out looks like this. We've got a column in our table that contains more tables. This is a thing that base R can't do. 
that the Tidyverse stuff can, the Tibble can. And this is really helpful if you want to make a lot of models all at once. Uh, so something like, uh, let me get rid of my credit card balance. Um, something like uh, the Gapminder world data set. If you wanted to run a regression for each country on the relationship between real GDP and life expectancy, or you wanted to estimate a time trend, so you regress life expectancy on year, you can get a different regression for 144 countries all at once, and you can store them in a column like we're doing here. Uh, I'd recommend in the R for Data Science book, R for Data Science, if you just Google that, you'll find the book by Hadley Wickham. There's a, ch well, screw it, let's take a look. R for Data Science.had.co.nz. And in here, the many models, uh, if you just follow along with this code, um, hey, David Robinson, I like him. So here is with the Gapminder world, what he does with this is creates nested data frames where there's the separate data for each country as a row item in this larger table. 142 countries, we've got the country, the continent, and then the data for that country. And then using that, you can apply with map a model. So you pipe the data set into the model and it spits out a linear regression item. And then you can put that as a column, a column of models. Now this blows my mind because I've been using R since before this was a possibility. For you, what you need to know is we've got a table of a thousand simulations and we've got a column that holds the output of each of those simulations. So we've got a column of tables 1,000 tables, one for each simulation. That's a cool thing that's harder to do uh, in uh, a for loop. Now, the next weird thing we do here is this call to unnest. And we're unnesting with the columns being simulation. So now we've got many rows with I1. This is our first simulation. We've got I1, their first, second, third round, and so on. Here we're finally in our second round, our second uh, simulation. It's 756 round. That agent had $44 at that point. So when we do this, now we've got out looking like this. Three columns. We've got, we've unnested the data. So now instead of one row for I and all of this data, all the stuff in these two columns, now we just stretch that out and now we've got 235 rows for I. Right, let's take out dollar I and put that through a table. And we'll see, well, this is a very hard to read table, but for uh, item one, 235 rows. Uh, for item two, 200, uh, 890 rows. There are 890 observations from the second simulation. Uh, round five and six, that agent made it to the full 1,000 rows. That's pretty cool. Let's, uh, let's take a quick look there. Let's go out. We're going to filter to I is um, five. And let's go to the end. So this agent ended with $10. Not bad. For row six, they ended with $25. So we've got some, we've got all the data basically from all the simulations. Uh, so this unnest uh, basically just says we're going to use simulations. We're going to create a list of things. We're going to use that list in a table, in a tibble, uh, so that we've got a column of all of these separate things, these separate simulations. Um, and then 
when we unnest them, we stretch something that's a thousand rows into something that's 580,000 rows. And then we return out with simulate many gamblers. So if I run that where our first argument is a thousand, it's going to take a thousand as the default for max rows, but it's going to say for how many we're going to do just a thousand, not 10,000. And I'm doing that because it's still taking a really long time on my computer. If I were to do that with 10,000, it would take, well, at least 10 times as long. So we'll leave it there for now. Let's just pipe this into a plot. So I'm grouping by the simulation and I'm asking at round 100. So simulation one, round 100, they had 115 of wealth. We got a thousand rows. This is good. This means that we haven't had anyone who lost all their money by row 100. We plug that into ggplot and we say wealth for the histogram with 10 bins. And we can see here is the distribution of outcomes after 100 rounds. And it's probably a good idea to do stuff like add labels. hundred rounds maybe it's not main maybe it's title there we go um, so there is some basic stuff to find a distribution of gambler wealth after some number of rounds so this bit of code we could again wrap into another function uh, and then that would let us see something else. Actually, let's find this. So what do we really care about here? We want to get the wealth back out. So if I simulate many gamblers for um, some value of how many, we'll stick with a thousand rounds as the default. We'll pipe that into... What do we pipe this into? We'll pipe this into filter round equals R distribution at round R is going to be a function that takes R as an input and we'll say round 100 by default and how many equals a thousand by default and then curly braces or my email curly braces and then we put this other stuff in oh all over the place with my keyboard right now all right no that's not what i want where am i there i am there we go. There's an indent, the indent to make it a little easier to read. So this, actually, I think this basically gives me what I want. Um, all I really care about, though, is the select, is the wealth itself, right? I don't really need to know the round. Let me show you that really quick. So if I do dist at round R with the default values, I'm going to get something out that's going to include a whole bunch of information about what round, and that round is going to be 100 every time, which is not super helpful. So I might as well just select that out, select down to wealth alone. Um, I guess I could keep I, but even that is really just a number. Uh, I don't really particularly care about that. So I'm going to select wealth. Let's see what it looks like. And then I think what I also want to do is say as.numeric so that it's going to spit out a numeric vector for me rather than a table with one column. And then let's set this up like we did here. Um, so there I've got some output. I hadn't done this as numeric thing yet, so let's 
Oops. Let's see what that looks like. And then I can pipe this into ggplot, AES. Um, actually, you know what? Maybe I don't want that as numeric. Um, plus can't be coerced to double. Well, there's a good reason to not do that. All right, so we select the wealth. Um, I guess I could keep I also. So let's just select out round. So what this is going to look like is it's going to keep that column of I is for which simulation were we in. Uh, and the wealth at round R, which is 100 by default. So let's check next at what's at 250. We'll again pipe it into ggplot, do a geom histogram, uh, and we'll again say bins equals 10. So distribution at round R where the round is 250, and again, we're running a thousand simulations. You know what? I can make this a little faster by just setting myself up to say only 10 simulations or some smaller number. We'll do 100. So here's with a thousand simulations, we get a distribution. We can see that it looks like pretty typical is around 60 bucks, something like that. Let's try at 250. We'll do just a hundred simulations so it doesn't take so long. After 250 rounds, we got a lot around 60. Um, let's try this a few more times. Just to see what we get. You can see it's getting kind of kind of messy at this point. Let's reduce our number of bins. So there's kind of more noise. Let's get rid of the default. I think it's 30 if we do that. So it's a little bit all over the place. We've only got 100 observations here, so there's a lot more variation. It's just like if you flip a coin 250 times, how many times do you get heads? Uh, you could get heads 250 times. Uh, if you do that a bunch, eventually you will flip 250 heads in a row. If you do that a bunch times 100 times, um, the proportion of weird outcomes is going to be small. Uh, it's going to be, sorry, larger. This is a law of small numbers thing. All right, I'm rambling now because I'm just talking into my computer, but let me just put law of small numbers. Basically, if you do something a small number of times, you're going to see weirder stuff. If you look at, say, the counties with the highest rates of colon cancer, you're going to find that the ones with the highest proportion are also the smallest uh, counties. If you look for where you have the lowest rates of colon cancer, they're also going to be the smallest counties. You got a county with one person and he's got colon cancer, that's how you find a 100% cancer rate. You find a county with one person with no colon cancer, that's how you get a 0%. Any normal sized county is going to have some people with it. Uh, in any case, uh, this is, you know, again, with simulation, we like to do large numbers because they're more reliable. We're less likely to get those weird outcomes. So here we found the distribution this way, but then we found how to wrap that up into some code so that we could do this multiple times. So now not only yeah, not only can we look at one gambler over many periods of time, but we can simulate many gamblers. I don't want to comment that out. We can simulate many gamblers. We can use that to find where they are after 100 rounds. But since we've got this wrapped up in a function anyways, rather than have all of this mess, we build this into its own function. And now it's really easy to try this with different values, right? So at 50, where do we end up? At 500, where do we end up? So we'll plug a thousand back in. It's gonna take longer, but let's just see. 
by encapsulating your code into functions, it becomes easier to build up to more complex stuff. Um, this, by the way, is how nature works, right? This is genetics. We build up simple tools out of molecules that run a bacterium, and that builds up to complex multicellular organisms like you and me. It happens in economics. You start with simple barter exchanges, and you build up to big, complicated networks of trade that we call multinational corporations. Taking simple things and building them up, we can do that in R also. So what we did so far is we found a way to roll the dice and we found a way to encapsulate. We found a way to roll that together into something that can take that rolling dice and encapsulate our game. We took that and we used it to make a bunch of simulations. We did that, wrapped that in a function so that we could simulate one gambler playing many rounds. And then we use that to simulate many gamblers playing many rounds. And then we use that to simulate many players playing many rounds and to see where they are at some particular round. And now we've got something where it's really easy for us to try a bunch of different things and compare them. Right? So let's go ahead and just copy this down. And we can say after compare 50 rounds to 500 rounds. After 500 rounds, we got some people who are out. After 50 rounds, we should see it a little further to the right. All right, now, the other thing, and I'll stop at extra credit because I've been going 40 minutes already. Find a distribution of gambler lifespan. So again, we're taking advantage of simulate many gamblers, right? And if anything goes wrong with simulate many gamblers, if there's some problem, we fix it in simulate many gamblers. We don't have to fix it many times throughout our code, right? So if we were just to take this code and plop it into here and plop it in twice for doing both of these distributions and then plop it in here also, and then we notice something wrong, we would have to fix that five or six times. This way, we only have to fix it once. So it's a lot easier to fix your code and to you know, avoid running into problems when we write functions. All right, so for lifespan, we simulate a bunch of gamblers, we group by the simulation, and then we filter out to see what is the last round for each of those gamblers. So again, when we do simulate many gamblers, I think out is what it should look like. We're going to get something that looks like this. The simulation, the round, and the wealth. We're going to group by the simulation, and then we're going to filter out row one, because one is not the maximum value of round for simulation one. We're going to filter out two, we're going to filter out three, we're going to filter down until whatever the biggest number is. So let's just see. This is what out. Group by I. Filter round is equal to, double equal, the max of round by group. And we can see round. Uh, simulation 1, we went to 235, we left with 0. 2, we went to 0. 5, we got to 100, uh, we went all 1,000 rounds and we were left with $10. So this is what we're doing with lifespan. We're really just tacking on a little bit of extra functionality. So let's look at... Oh, let's define the function, load it into the workspace. Let's run the function. Unused argument initial wealth. Oh, I took initial wealth out of above. I didn't actually have it built in properly up here. So simulate many gamblers. We're just using that default of 100. All right, lifespan. Let's run it. 10,000 rounds as our maximum for 1,000 gamblers. And then we're going to see how long they last. 
Uh, so again, we're going to run a histogram on this. So I'm saving this into an object because I'm running so many simulations that it's taking a long time. Uh, so it's a lot easier to save it and then fiddle around with the ggplot stuff, right? So I could just run this and pipe it directly into the ggplot. I think I did something like that up here. Um, easier would be to do something like, um, well, in this case, it wasn't too bad. But in this case, since it's, it's still running, it's still taking this much time, it's just going to be a lot easier if I save it and then figure stuff out rather than have to wait a minute and a half every single time I try to tweak something about my plot. In any case, what we should end up getting is something like this, where we got for each row the round they lasted to and their level of wealth at that round. So when I put that through a histogram, what I'm going to be left with is a histogram where we've got a bunch of values that are less than a thousand. That's going to say basically how rare is it for a gambler to only make it 235 rounds. Here we go, finally finished, let's run the histogram. So it's pretty rare for someone to make it not very far to make it, you know, basically to be out within a hundred rounds. Um, let's see that, let's uh, take X and we will arrange in ascending order by round. So the shortest round or the shortest simulation was simulation 179, where that gambler ran out of money at 165 rounds. So this must be below 200. We've got seven gamblers who only made it that far, that were exceptionally unlucky. More common is around 500. So given the basic odds of this game, if you go in with hundred dollars, you're probably a good guess of how long you'll last is 500 rounds. Uh, in this case, no one lasted all the way to 10,000 rounds, but we did get some way off in the other direction. So let's arrange in descending order of round. Someone lasted, we had three gamblers who lasted more than 2,000 rounds. These are our super lucky gamblers. They're going to tell you that they've got a surefire win to last longer than anyone else at this game. They're going to sell you a book about this, but don't listen to them. This is just some exceptionally lucky gamblers. How exceptional? Well, three out of a thousand. The chance of getting more than 2,000 rounds without running out of money would look to be about 0 0.003. Um, cool. Cool. So with that, we can now take this game of chance and ask questions about how long will you go? How much money will you win after a certain amount of time? And we've set it up in a way where we can manipulate and change these questions in a bunch of little tiny ways to try different variations of this without having to rewrite a whole bunch of code. If we want to try this, well, 10,000 rounds was too much, so let's just say we go for... Uh, let's try 3,000 rounds. Let's say we want to run it 10,000 times. Now it's really easy for us to run that new simulation. It's still going to take a really long time, so I'm going to end this video before it does run, uh, or before it finishes running. But you can see how easy it is to set up the logic of this and then redeploy that logic to exploit that basic logic that you've set up with a bunch of little variations. Does this change with our number of simulations? Does it change with how many rounds we go? Does our distribution change depending on if we look at 50 or 500? Uh, does our simulation, does our outcome change if we change our initial wealth or our number of max rounds? We can tweak all these little things and the code is easier. Uh, it's, you know, the stuff that's done is mostly done in only one place, right? So we only have this one little thing for rolling the dice, and we reuse that a bunch of times. 
uh, one round encapsulates that and encapsulates the basic payoff logic. We are not re-implementing that all the way down. We just call on one round. Um, so that is my take on the non-extra credit part of this. This is still running because 10,000 is a pretty big number of simulations to do here. If I was doing this in a for loop, I might have to just go to bed and come back and check on it in the morning. Here, I'm probably going to get it in another 20 minutes. Uh, all right, so I hope that was helpful. Uh, this is 50 minutes, which is longer than I had intended on going, but hopefully thorough enough. Uh, as always, feel free to ask questions, and I'll see you in the future.